Let's take a moment and thank our sponsors, Seek. Keep sensitive log data entirely within your own infrastructure using Seek. Whether you use Serialog, Nlog, or .NET's built-in logger, Seek gets you centralized search, dashboarding, and alerting, all without having to share your data with third parties. Check it out at datalust.co slash seq. That's datalust.co slash seq. Hi, I'm Scott Hanselman. This is another episode of Hansel Minutes. Today I'm chatting with John Warner. He's an American writer and editor, a teacher of writing. He's the author of seven books, including Why They Can't Write. He's also the editor of McSweeney's Internet Tendency. How are you, sir? I'm good. How are you? I am very well. I am very much enjoying your book. It came out in 2018 uh, called Why They Can't Write. That is talking about basically why my young sons are not having fun in their writing classes. And I had so much fun in my writing classes. Um, why can't they write? Well, it's a complicated story and it's a question of not only pedagogy or how we teach. It's not a question of sort of generational defect, which is something that often gets thrown around with these sorts of things and has in fact, as I talk about in the book, been thrown around. Uh, I have a quote from the, um, a, a dean at Harvard in 1868 complaining about how the students can't write and they're, they're defective. So this has always been there. So it's not that. It's mostly around the kinds of uh, writing, or as I argue in the book, non-writing, that the system incentivizes students to do. Highly prescriptive, highly, highly programmatic, repetitive assignments, which the five-paragraph essay as I talk about in the book, is sort of the, the chief avatar of. It's, it's more a symptom than a cause. But we're not allowing students the pleasure and interest in writing inside genuine rhetorical situations with audiences and purpose and a reason to write, other than to pass an assessment that somebody is going to grade for an AP test or that kind of thing. So we've really, we've cut off students from the aspects of learning to write that are interesting and pleasurable and will make us want to learn to write more and replace them with what I call writing related imitations. These assessment driven experiences that really don't do much in terms of helping students learn to write. Yeah. To give you some context and our listeners some context about why I'm interested in this topic is I have a 15 year old who's a freshman and a 17 year old who's a junior. They are both people like my 17 year old wrote a 300 page book called Zombie World in Google Docs. And he has been working on this book for years and he loves it and he's having fun with it. And it is horrible. It is just an awful, awful, awful book. But I don't tell him that because he's just having so much fun slapping the keyboard. But he cannot crack 88% in his AP English class. And we're sitting down looking at the rubric and we're trying to figure out why this five paragraph essay, he cannot for the life of him get an A. And suddenly his his teacher wants his writing to be on rails and it's sucking the joy out of zombie world. Yeah. The the kind of young person that wants to sit down and write a 300 page novel and don't be too harsh. Everybody's first novel is <laughs> is not great. I, I know this from personal experience. But the, the the young person who wants to sit down and spends their time doing that is particularly ill served by a system that says you must fit yourself into this prescription, and it's highly high, highly prescriptive to the point where. So I spent many years teaching first year college writing, what used to be called freshman composition back when I was in college. And I would ask students, what makes a good essay? And they would tell me things like, well, it has five paragraphs. And the thesis goes at the end of the first paragraph. And you use transition words in between each paragraph. And the conclusion, of course, always starts with in conclusion. I remember one student I had who she had kept her English notebook from high school. And she showed me the six pages of transition words she had written down in her notebook that her teacher had said were okay. And this is not writing. Writing is, uh, as I say in the book and over and over again, and when I talk about these things, writing is thinking. It is both the expression of an idea, that is we have something to say, right? And we want to get it done on the page. But it's also the exploration of an idea. The attempts at saying it will alter 
what we think about the idea as we go. And I was teaching first year writing, and I would ask students, how many of you learned something about your topic that changed your perception of it while you were writing? And the answer was almost zero. And this is actually something that should be constantly present in writing. It happens to me, I write a lot of different things for different places, and it happens every single time I write. In fact, if it doesn't happen, I'm suspicious about what I'm doing. Something's gone wrong. And yet most students I work with, and these are college freshmen at you know, reasonably selective schools. I taught at University of Illinois, Virginia Tech, Clemson, College of Charleston. They had never experienced this. They, they had not had that opportunity, at least not in school. Now, some of them had gone and, and done their own things. Like I, I would have students ask to talk creative writing and students would bring in their 300 page zombie novel on the first day and say, can we talk about this in class? Which is awesome. It's great enthusiasm. I love it. I, I, we can't read a 300 page novel for class, but they had done it on their own. I'd say like, whose class did you do with sin? Oh, no, no, no. This was, this was just for fun. Why can't all writing have some element of fun? There's no, there's no inherent reason why that can't be true. Yeah, it's really sucked the joy out of it. And right now we are deep in the House on Mango Street essays, and we're deep into the To Kill a Mockingbird essays. And by the time the third draft has been written, they're just not having fun anymore. And they've learned nothing. So then, God bless them, it's, well, Cliff's notes. And then they want to, can chat GPT write this for me? Because suddenly what was a joy is now wrote, and they are being, they're on a a writing assembly line like like uh, like Lucy in I Love Lucy and it's just the the rubrics are coming at them so fast that they can't spit out the words and it's computers it's like I just what are they, just tell me the output that she wants so that she'll leave me alone for the next the next assignment when did this start i remember five paragraph essays in the 80s it's been a, something of an evolution and and there's a lot of kind of factors that have gone into it i mean the the origins that i trace it to are really a report from the 80s called um, A Nation at Risk, which was commissioned by the Reagan administration, and the Department of Education, that um, tried to sound this alarm around the lack of achievement of American school children relative to, at the, at the time, Japan. Everybody believed Japan was the country that was going to sort of eat our collective lunch. This begat a kind of um, long 30 year, 30 plus year now arc around what is commonly called school reform, but is really a number of different things cobbled together. One motive of it is a kind of market based reform around charter schools and vouchers and privatization and this kind of stuff. But it also had this effect on assessing and tracking and monitoring student what they would call achievement. Uh, I, I would question whether or not we were actually tracking achievement. But this whole apparatus around tracking students and monitoring students raised up with some good reasons. We want to see if there are schools where students are under-resourced and performing poorly and this sort of stuff. But it really came to dominate the field. And then when we see No Child Left Behind under George W. Bush and Race to the Top under President Barack Obama, we really are enmeshed in this system where a fairly narrow slice of student work, and even within that narrow, essentially reading, writing, and math, and then a, a very narrow component of those things within those is what's being measured and therefore is what's being valued. There's this concept called Campbell's Law that I think explains this well, and Campbell, he was a sociologist who, who studied schools and achievement. And it essentially says, once the indicator becomes the measurement, the measurement is no longer worth anything. So where a measurement is measuring good underlying practices, it's useful. Once the measurement substitutes for itself, it's no longer useful. So if students producing a five-paragraph essay is the subject of good writing processes and a well-organized essay and that kind of stuff, great. But once we say, oh, producing a five-paragraph essay is the point, that corrupts the instruction. And it's now that we're really sort of just at the end of the arc. The, the first time I really noted this was right around 2004, 2005. I was teaching at Virginia Tech. And I had a student who had deep anxiety about writing in my first year writing class, who had also been salutatorian of her high school class. 
but almost didn't pass what were called the standards of learning, these state exams in Virginia, because she couldn't do the writing. It was a timed experience. She would simply freeze up and choke. And she almost didn't graduate high school because of this, even though she, she had straight A's all through high school and was a very, very capable writer. And that kind of system that imposed that kind of thing on the students, that's the first time I noticed it. And it only has gotten worse since then, subsequent generations of students. And Campbell, uh, Donald Campbell, said that the ultimate end of this is cheating. Because if you make them go all the way through with these high stakes testing and metrics, the, what else can they do but cheat? If the incentive is to score well on the assessment, students will do whatever it takes to score well on the assessment. And therefore, if cheating is, it becomes a rational decision, right? It's not academic dishonesty because what we're signaling is whatever you, the score you get on this is what's most important. If I can use Cliff Notes or Plagiarize or now Chat GPT, why wouldn't I do that? It's a horrible message to send to students. And now that my hope is now that ChatGPT can do these things in a matter of seconds, we'll re-examine what we ask students to do. And you say in your in your book, Why They Can't Write, that giving students writing tasks that are synthesizing knowledge, which coincidentally is something that computers are supposed to be really good at, that they will go and struggle with those kinds of tasks. Those skills take a lot of practice. We don't really give them time to practice. We drop in somewhere in seventh or eighth grade and we say, five paragraphs, read this book and TLDR the entire book into a couple of paragraphs, but do it the way I want, with the words I want, with the transition words that I want. And you're saying, and your very popular uh, Substack article uh, says that chat GPT really can't kill anything that's worth preserving. That's a pretty big statement for a person who teaches writing. Well, so your audience knows this better than I do around the technology of chat GPT, but it really is just a syntax assembling machine and a regurgitator of what's already in the world. It cannot create anything new, certainly not intentionally. I've had some fun with it mixing around prompts and building on prompts and that kind of stuff, but that's me sort of... A, the, the writer and human intelligence using it as a tool. By itself, it can't do, a, do any of these things. And it certainly can't when reading a book like To Kill a Mockingbird or The House on Mango Street, it cannot have a response to that. It has no independent emotional or uh, experience of that book. And if we can, when I would teach literature, I would start there. We don't want to just say, oh, it's a good book or it's a bad book. It's like, what does this book do to you as a human being? How does it move you? What is its meaning in the world? What is its meaning in your life? That's where we start. And then we'll find something to write about as opposed to thinking there is one answer or a, a narrow slice of answers that are acceptable about this book that we have to program into you because that's what the assessment wants, and which is how, unfortunately, much of the AP advanced placement curriculum works. It's just not how it is in the world. You know, I grew up loving reading because I got to create meaning out of the world of the books I read and the, the life I experienced. And that we're cutting students off from that in the name of education is sort of the greatest irony I can possibly imagine. You know, and putting the perspective of what chat GPT can and can't do through the lens of some of the things that you talk about in your book, you talk about the primary dimensions of a practice. You talk about knowledge and skills, which I think we can agree chat GPT at least pretends to have. But then you talk about habits, how things think, and then attitudes, which chat GPT arguably can't have. So the stuff that we're teaching you know, take this book, know it, think about it, and then spit it out. That's definitely a computery type thing. But it, its attitudes and its habits are really limited or even biased by the material that it's trained on. So it could create some pretty problematic essays, but have no opinion about whether it's bad or good. And we have to then count on humans to uh, filter that out or make sure that the model doesn't say things that it shouldn't be saying. One of the interesting phenomenon around the rise of this, and and in a lot of ways, I feel ahead of some of my my colleagues who teach writing and, and think about these things, in that I was experimenting and looking at previous versions. I looked at, at GPT-2 and was frankly quite unimpressed and thought this stuff is years away from being as good as it is now. So, so that'll show me. But the attitudes and habits of mind of writers is where writers live. And embodying a practice is how we go through life. Something like um, well, 
for your audience. Computer programming is not merely a matter of skills and knowledge. There are also attitudes and habits of mind that make you a good programmer. I have a, 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 a good friend where I live in Charleston, South Carolina, who's in his uh, late 70s, but made his living as a computer programmer before you could even compile your programs. He, he had to handwrite his programs and he would, he would have to think them through. And, you know, he's now older. He's like, one of the big problems with programmers today is they don't have to think about their programs before they test if they're going to work. But he's talking about a habit of mind, right? And an, and an attitude. And these are things that can evolve over time. And we get tools that help us with that and, and that kind of thing. But if we don't also help students build those capacities, and these are capacities that obviously extend beyond just writing, right? It's sort of like life 101 in a lot of ways. Why are they in school? This is another thing I say in the book is that life is to be lived, including between the ages of five and 22. And so the notion that school is not life never made sense to me. School is simply the life you live when you're five to 22, if you're going to go all the way through college. Why not also think of school in those contexts, particularly when we can have students learn while embracing that kind of attitude? There's no divide between learning things and also recognizing that school can be like life. Indeed. The feeling that I get, though, I think this is universal for the last hundred years, but I think that my kids feel like something it's something to endure and something to overcome. And then the real stuff starts. And I keep telling them to try to think about it differently than that. It's well, you know, the, the problem is the system works against them thinking that way. The, mostly what we signal to students is there is some indefinite future payoff to what you're doing now. Can't tell you when, can't tell you what, but it'll be there. Just trust us. Yeah. And we all know how humans do great about indefinite future payoffs. Uh, yeah. yeah. I would see it in the students I would work with who had been great successes in high school, right? And they get to college and they're like, I'm here. And then the first semester, they're sort of crushed by the fact that A, a lot of the stuff they experienced previously isn't actually all that helpful. The first year writing involves a lot of kind of deprogramming around these things. And B, that there's just more of it in front of them. So the sooner we help students practice I talk a lot about agency and self-efficacy and that kind of stuff, the better. It's just the what your kids are experiencing does not value that. In fact, when they engage in that, they probably do worse in school. And that becomes its own problem. Hey, friends, here's an opportunity that's bigger than just a regular sponsorship. As you may know, I'm coming up on almost 900 episodes of the Hansel Minutes podcast, and I've recorded hundreds and hundreds of those episodes with Zencaster. That's Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R. Zencaster allows me to record all of these podcasts and talk to guests from all over the world, and they've recently announced crowdfunding. Uh, you can actually invest in Zencaster for as little as $100, and you can join a community of their investors. I have, in fact, invested in Zencaster. I remember when it was just a one or two person shop. They're now raising money because the podcasting industry has grown and so big. Actually, they're saying that the projections are going to be more than 150 billion by 2030. Podcasting is where it's at. So if you are interested in investing in Zencaster, you can go to WeFunder, W E F U N D E R, WeFunder.com slash Zencaster. That's Zencaster without the E at the end. So Z-E-N-C-A-S-T-R, wefunder.com slash Zencaster, or just click the link in my episode description below, and you can claim your slice of the future of podcasting. Getting to the, the real point where we have a situation where AIs are now doing the part of life that's supposed to be fun, the creative stuff, like generating art. Uh, without yet getting into the legality of the training at on material that already exists, it's it's surprising that rather than having it do the boring stuff, it's doing the creative fun stuff. From the perspective of my kids, though, it is doing the boring stuff. So if we say, yeah, let them use ChatGPT, go nuts, then what what is the fun part then? Like what's beyond it? <laughs> well, you know, it's an interesting question. I there's sort of three camps around the rise of this technology in terms of people who who do what I do and think about what I think about in terms of teaching and teaching writing. One is we've got to police it and we've got to ban it because this thing is ruined. Okay. What we're so that's do. one idea. That's yeah. one idea. Another is we need to start integrating this as a tool into everything we ask students to do 
because it's out there. It's obviously going to have a huge influence. BuzzFeed, I think it was yesterday as we're recording, said they're going to start using this technology to write more material for their their website. Right? <laughs> Yay, more listicles from BuzzFeed. And it's you know, and and it's it's clearly already been used. Um, in terms of generating clicks for SEO purposes on search, right? Search, there's a reason why Google search has become markedly worse over the last 12 to 18 months because the, the, it's been flooded with garbage. The, the third group, which is what I identify with, is that writing is still writing. This thing does exist in the world. And we should help students understand it as a tool or perhaps a toy or something in between that can and will be useful to them. But the more they know about writing, the better their skills, knowledge, attitudes, and habits of mind, the more secure and rounded the writer's practice, the more useful this tool will be to them. So I'm, I'm not a, I'm, I'm not shoving students into the embrace of chat GPT because I think that, that, remove some of the important context that students should have about writing. On the other hand, trying to police this is futile. The AI will always stay one step ahead of the detectors. Teachers spending all their time trying to figure out if a student has used it is a waste of time that could be spent doing something else. It's just, it's just not what we should be doing. Unfortunately, this seems to be what a lot of kind of the big administrative responses are at this stage. Yeah. Well, we like to ban things that we don't <laughs> understand. Oh, or we don't agree with. Let me, let me uh, just, you're not a programmer. I'm a programmer. So I'm going to draw a parallel between two things that I think we have both experienced and you might follow along. And I think it might be interesting to you. So there was a time when we would write, maybe we would write in WordStar or WordPerfect and it was uh, white text on a black screen and that was fine. Uh, we didn't have spell check. And then the, the red squigglies came along. And like, oh, red squigglies. Oh my God. Right click on a red squiggly. And then the green squigglies came along with a grammar squigglies and then grammarly came along and now my kids just say accept all on grammarly and they assume that it was correct and it's unfortunately correct 85 percent of the time which is why they seem to get b minuses in the programmer world when i started it was white text on a black screen and then we got syntax highlighting oh the text is in color and now when i type it anticipates the next few characters and then it anticipates the next few words. And now I can type in English, write me a for loop in C++, and it will do that for me. And I can probably hit tab and enter, and it'll probably be about B+. So then the world just becomes this big B+, mediocre generated thing that will work fine until it totally doesn't work. I, I'm trying to understand how I don't turn into old man who shakes fist <laughs> at cloud. <laughs> You know, sometimes it's it's necessary to go shake our fists at cloud, but I at clouds. I hear you though. I, I worry about this about myself, right? Like I'm 52 years old. Um, I I by and large, right? I I grew up handwriting my essays and learning penmanship, and it was always horrible because I had horrible penmanship, and and my grades were bad because of it, and it, it was a hindrance. I sometimes I've written, I wrote an essay about how my life as a writer didn't start until I learned how to type. And then when I got my first computer, an Apple IIe, I believe it was, when I was in uh, an eighth grade or freshman in high school. So these tools have really made a big difference to me. And uh, I love spell check because I'm kind of a lousy speller. Grammar check can be handy when you are following up behind it to make sure it's not doing something bad to your voice or your uh, message. The predictive texts, and this is now happening, the, for some reason, the Microsoft ver Word version that I have on my iPad is always predicting texts. I do not know how to turn it off. It drives me crazy, partly because it's right about 60% of the time, but also, because even when it's not right, I'm still tempted to follow it. And I, I think this is, this is a problem. The underlying part of, of your question is, I think, making sure that we re-examine and look at the underlying values that we associate with good work or quality work. And one of the things, I don't know if this is true of programming, but I, I suspect it may be true because it's writing, it's language, right? It's efficiency and speed are not necessarily a virtue when it comes to quality and writing. 
Now, it may be in certain contexts. There may be good reasons for for emphasizing speed and efficiency, but they certainly are not associated with learning. Speed and efficient, efficiency, in fact, I think are anti are, are are anti correlated with learning. And so, when we have these tools that try to speed us along, I think that's a problem. And another issue that's going to arise with ChatGPT already that I've been trying to fight against before it gets too far is using ChatGPT as a feedback machine for student writing because it gives instant feedback. There's no benefit to instant feedback on writing. In fact, one of the best things any writer can do is to write something, go walk the dog or take a nap and come back to it and look at it fresh when you've sort of, I don't know if this is going to be accurate for a programming crowd, but I think of it as like, I need to clear the cache of my brain. Look at what I've done before. Yeah, well, we go take a shower, and then the problem, the answer comes to you in the shower, oh, and then yes. you rush back to the typewriter. And this is a, you know, this is a well-established uh, cognitive phenomenon by research that this this is how our brains work, and to the extent that we allow machine learning or machine processes substitute for our human brain, I think is a mistake, and the more comfortable we get with it, the harder it's going to be to roll back. Yeah. You call out uh, later in the book how the Conference of College Composition and Communication, the CCCC, came up with these 12 principles for teaching writing. And one of those principles refers to the relationship between technology and writing. So like people who aren't just you are thinking about this, like sound writing instructions that emphasize relationships between writing and technologies. So it seems like incorporating this as a tool, just like Grammarly, just like spell check is important. It's just when the when the students think that it's a shortcut, when everything in life is a shortcut. Right it now. has to be purposeful, right? It has to be, we have to be in charge of the tool. We don't just like have automatic hammers that leap out of our toolbox and start running around our house, hitting any nail that's sticking out of the wall. Yeah. This is a thing that sort of drives me bonkers about, about AI and this kind of stuff that worries about AI. Uh, and you, you would know better than me about why this is the case, but I'm sort of like, aren't we in charge? <laughs> aren't we the humans? Like, do we not have agency over these things? Ultimately, could we not choose otherwise? Now I get, I get why once the cat's out of the bag, it's hard to do, right? Like, um, uh, like Dolly, the, the, the graphic, uh, the image generator, the image generator it's amazing. Right. And it's, it does stuff that humans do very, very quickly and in often cases well, depending on your need. There's a huge ethical dimension around that. What what are we going to do in a world where this stuff can do it for humans? And of course, there's lots of human work that ChatGPT can do now. Maybe that's a good thing. I don't know. I think it says something about the kind of writing ChatGPT is good at as much as anything. It begins to boggle my mind, which is why I retreat back to, to my field, which is teaching writing, right, and, and writing myself. Like, I, I know ChatGPT is not a threat to how I teach or how I write. And, and if ChatGPT wants to program itself on me and my voice where I get to use that as a tool, maybe I'll mess around with it. But um, my writing is me, and I enjoy it. Like, I, I spend most of my day writing stuff, and because that's what I like to do, I've oriented my work around this. So, it doesn't worry me at that level, at the individual level. It doesn't worry me about how I would relate to students. It does concern me about a world that is kind of rushing headlong into the embrace of this technology. Yeah. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, how do you, how do you feel about that? It's, I'm cu- I don't get to talk to people from your background that often. No, that's great. Well, so, so well, we're returning to the really, the really important uh, question at hand here is how does this affect zombie world? Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I talked to my son and he used it to generate names because he had gone, he'd drawn a blank and he couldn't think of any cool names. So he, he didn't go and say, write me a fight scene or I need three pages of walking in the forest. He said, I need cool names for a bad guy. And that felt like a reasonable thing. What he was looking for was was inspiration. He was trying to use it as a writer's block tool. But then he recognized that it wasn't writing the way he wanted to write. So he gave up. So both of my boys have tried, sampled, and pushed away ChatGPT. And, and my guess is with your son writing the novel, the chief pleasure is is the do like the story unfolding for himself. 
as right. it puts on the page. I, I have a line in, in my novel that I published and is out of print called The Funny Man, where it was a little Easter egg I put in there for myself. And it says, everyone has a story and the best ones are the ones we tell ourselves. Because that was my experience of writing. I put it in there before I knew the novel was going to be published because I wanted to affirm the fact that I had spent eight years writing this thing, that it was worth doing. And that's what your son is experiencing. To outsource part of the pleasure doesn't really make sense. To use it as a tool that might get over a hump, that's fine. And there's there's programs like that. There's one called PseudoWrite that I know a lot of folks use to kind of sketch things out that they fill in. And, and that's all well and good. It's not It's not of interest to me. But I think in good hands, those are perfectly useful in the same way, you know, a good programmer can use tools that help compile and and check syntax and that kind of thing. I just need them to be mature enough to make those decisions to say, well, this wasn't any fun. Yeah, well, and and to have a system where fun is is valued, right? Yeah. Where, Where fun is something that matters. Yeah. And then also, I think that the definition of tedium is changing generationally. This is another weird analogy because I'm all about weird analogies. Like I love adventure games like Zelda where I'm running around in a meadow and I'm off to save the princess or whatever. But now if you have the same game on an, iP- on an iPad or an iPod, you just say auto navigate and then the little dude will just run, fight the zombies for you. And you're just watching it at this point. You don't have to push any buttons or maybe you just have to push a button to collect strawberries. Mm-hmm. And it's like, no, and then just watch an ad. And it's like, well, you just sucked all the fun out of it. It's all, simu- we were- all simulation, right? Yeah, I'm just, I'm just a right. spectator. So I don't want people to be a spectator at writing or painting or creating. I want them to have fun. But then you get into the pressures of society and capitalism that just say endure. So <laughs> I, I am also a little bit frustrated that people, and that'll probably go all the way up to the legislation and our leaders, don't understand the technology because it's moving so fast, right? The internet as a series of tubes is very likely still the level of understanding that uh, the legislators and the school board has around a technology like this. It's it's unfortunate. And I would almost say they're playing catch up, except they've almost not even started the race in a lot of ways. They've, they've, oh, nev- yeah. they've never... They've never really tried to deal with these things. And and unfortunately, in, in the education tech sector, there's a lot of companies out there that are not particularly worried about their stuff being all that good, as long as it's saleable and you target a problem and you market it as, I'm going to solve this problem for you. And then that thing is in school districts and thousands of students are using it. And then five years later, you realize that th- this program is actually not worth anything and Millions of dollars have been spent. Thousands of students have used it. We're not even back to square one. We're sort of pre-square one because we have not dealt with those fundamentals, the underlying stuff that students should be doing in order to learn. Well, I want to leave our audience with uh, what I thought was the best part of your ChatGPT article, and we'll include links to all of your things and your books, as well as your Substack in the show notes. You say that we need to value the process rather than the product. Students should see that we are showing an interest in their learning rather than in their performance. And if we can just get back to that, it's the journey, not the destination, then I think we'll be okay. Yeah. The companion book to why they can't write, the writer's practice, which is a sort of book of curriculum that it's the curriculum I used in my classes and that I I compiled for other people to make use of and adapt. I stopped calling everything an assignment. I didn't assign essays. I give writing experiences. And then I assess and grade those experiences according to the totality of the experience involving students in that assessment, reflecting on what they've learned and what they've experienced. And I can testify from teaching this and and now the book having been out in the world for a few years and other people teaching it, it really does work. Students can get involved. And uh, as we speak, I'm working on a, a course to help a, a digital self-paced continuing ed course for teachers to help think through these problems and for themselves decide what kinds of experiences help my students learn in writing context. What kind of processes do I want them to do so we can get away from all this stuff? This is why in that article on Substack, I I kept saying, this is an opportunity. We might not take it, but this is an opportunity to examine the things we ask students to do and really see if those are the things they should be doing if our goal is helping students learn to write. John Warner, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Oh, it's my pleasure.
We've been chatting with John Warner, American writer, editor, and teacher of writing, and the author of many books, including Why They Can't Write, The Writer's Practice, and Sustainable, Resilient, and Free, The Future of Public Higher Education. I'm going to include a link to his substack, which is biblioracle.substack.com. We'll have links in the show notes, as well as to all of his books. Thank you so much. This has been another episode of Hansel Minutes, and we'll see you again next week.